Hello, welcome to a Scott on Scotch. This is a YouTube channel dedicated to celebrating and discussing all aspects of Scotch whisky and just occasionally some other spirits as well. I am Neil Murphy, I am a writer, a blogger and a, a lover of whisky. I have a passion for Scotch and I like to share that as often as I possibly can. So this channel was set up for that very reason, so that we can we can come together and discuss and celebrate our love for Scotch whisky. Um, and there's been quite a lot going on recently, so I've got quite a lot that I want to talk about in this video. Um, first, first of all, I recently rebranded, um, rejuvenated, if you like, my my own website. Previously, I had my blog, which was here and this YouTube channel, which was here, and I've decided to kind of bring the two together a wee bit. Uh, so I used to just write under whiskeyreviews.net. I have used that name since 2015, and while it was straight and to the point, there wasn't an awful lot of thought went into it. Um, whereas when I came up with the YouTube channel, I felt really passionately about using the name of Scott on Scotch, for those that don't know, that name is influenced, it's inspired by a book that was compiled and edited by Pip Hills, uh, the, the founder of the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, uh, back in 1991, I believe, early 90s anyway. Uh, and, and that book was all about sort of exploring and celebrating Scotch whiskey and its place in Scottish culture back in the 90s. Um, and I thought that that's not really something that anybody's doing now, you know. Um, and there's a lot going on in the world of Scotch whisky at the minute that that makes me feel like maybe it's losing its identity a little bit, that it's forgetting its heritage a little bit. I'll give you one example. Just recently, I saw talk of a new Mortlach single malt from Diageo, and I think they've called it the Katana's Edge. Katana obviously being a Japanese sword. And, you know, it just feels like, I, while I understand that places like Japan and, you know, these other markets, they're massively important to Scotch whisky. Of course they are. The, the whole category's success is based on the love that people have for it all over the world, right? It couldn't exist without the support of these other markets. But does that mean that it needs to abandon where it's from, that it needs to abandon its own history, its own culture. I, I don't think it should mean that, right? So for me personally, calling a whiskey the Katana's Edge does not speak of Scotland, it does not speak of Dufton, and it does not speak of Speyside, and it does not speak of Mortlach. And those are the things I want my single malt to speak of. If you're a Mortlach single malt, Speak of Mortlach and Speyside and Dufton and the people and the stories and the history that made that single malt what it is. A katana, a Japanese sword, just doesn't have anything to do with it, you know. Um, now, I, I believe there were some Japanese oak casks or something used in the making of it, but, you know, what's that got to do with the sword, you know? it just It just feels like... We're rushing to abandon things that, that this category was traditionally associated with, you know. And and again, I'm not asking for every single Scotch whiskey to be bedecked and tartan and antlers and claymores and, and advertised by hairy highlanders and kilts. But, you know, there's got to be a balance and there's got to be a, a, a sort of line somewhere that, that both celebrates the heritage of the product while also, you know, looking to the future and finding new ways of doing it, you know. Um, so anyway, I haven't tried the Mortlach Mall. I'm sure it's lovely, you know, but it, it, why is it called the Katana's Edge? It's nonsense. It's just total nonsense. But that that's partly the inspiration behind the, the naming of the channel, you know. It just feels like we're losing our identity a wee bit. It's Scotch whiskey. It is the product of Scotland. And there's a whole array of things that have gone into making this. The people, the culture, the stories, the folklore, the history. That has all shaped Scotch whisky to make it the product that it is. And globalisation is a great thing in many ways. 
But we don't want to lose the things that make individual places what they are. We don't want everywhere all over the world to become the same. That would be really boring, right? So I don't think there's anything wrong with people of Scotland standing up and saying, hang on a minute, this is our whiskey. Um, but yeah, so that that's partly why we ended up with a Scot on Scotch. And I like that name so much that I thought, why don't I just unite the channel and the blog? And instead of being whiskeyreviews.net, I should just be the Whiskey Reviews blog on a scotonscotch.com. So that's what we've done. That's where you can now find me, a scotonscotch.com. You'll find my videos there. You'll find my blogs there. You'll find various other things, some news and stuff from around the whiskey industry. Maybe even some information about uh, tastings that I might be involved in coming up. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, it's all going to be in the one place now, which makes things a wee bit easier and a bit more streamlined, shall we say. So, speaking about tastings... Uh, I actually have one coming up, so as this video goes out, the tasting's probably at the end of the week. Uh, it's going out Friday the 10th of May, and it's very close to my heart, the, the theme of this tasting. I usually don't... I usually don't pick a particular subject when I'm doing a tasting. Usually it's just, here's six whiskies I've found that I think are interesting, right? But this time around, I had an idea in my head and I wanted to, to explore the history of the Isle of Isla uh, in terms of their distilleries. Now, again, this grew out of something that Rachel McNeil has done with the Isla Whiskey Academy. Uh, it's called the Enchanting Scotland Show, and it explores the history of, you know, Isla and Scotland, but, but through certain dates. And then for each date, we have a whiskey that we sort of put... Uh, that helps us to tell the story through a whiskey tasting, right? Part of that story revolves around the malt tax, riots or protests of 1725. And that's a really fascinating story to me because it's it sort of happens mainly in Glasgow, where I'm from, where I am now. And, and the effects of that protest had a massive knock-on effect for the whiskey industry and in particular for Isla. So I always thought you could start the story there at the malt protests and then explore what comes next bit by bit. There's a very obvious sequence that happens there with different distilleries opening up at different times and the story just sort of unfurls in front of you, you know. So that's the taste that I'm hosting on the 10th of May. Coincidentally... I, I, it's kind of weird the way it's worked out because for a, a tasting that explores the story of Isla from 1725 till 2005 when Kilhoman opens and then there's a sort of dot 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 because we know the story's not finished there well guess what happens on the 10th of May Ardna Ho release their first ever single malt so it's almost like I'm covering the story so far, and then Ardna Ho arrives on the market to take the story further. Here's the next Isla Malt coming out, the first one to come on the market since Kilhoman back in 2009. It is exciting times, I have to say. I have followed the Ardna Ho story from the beginning, really. I was really fortunate to be shown around the building site when it was just a concrete foundation. I was back a year later when the distillery was up and running but not open to the public yet. There was still the odd cable hanging from the roof and stuff. But I tasted a sample of a test run of spirit that had come off the stills. So I, I have been there from the beginning. I must have visited six or seven times since then, maybe. I don't know. And I have tasted two-and-a-half-year-old spirit, three-year-old whiskey, four-year-old whiskey, four-and-a-half-year-old whiskey, and now here we are, 10th of May, we're getting the first-ever five-year-old Ardnaho single malt, the inaugural release. I believe it's bottled at 50% ABV, and it's going to be retailing around £70 a bottle, which, for a new sort of first release, is reasonable. Um, there's probably a conversation to be had that no single malt of five years should ever be costing £70. 
But we know how these things tend to go. Debut releases can be excessive. We've had some recently that are closer to £200. So 70 seems an absolute bargain in comparison. Um, I will be after a bottle, there's no doubt about that, maybe even a couple. Um, and yeah, it, it feels like a big deal. You know, there's lots of new distilleries opening up all the time. And we've had lots of new single malts coming on the market over the last few years. And they're always kind of a bit of excitement. But a new Isla, to me anyway, this feels like a whole other thing, you know. Um, Isla is the, the place I'm most passionate about in this Scotch whiskey world. I love whiskey from everywhere, but Isla is the one that really gets me going, you know. Uh, so this this feels like a big deal. Uh, I just hope that the, the product is as good as I think it's going to be. Uh, I'm confident the samples I've had at various different ages have been impressive. Although I think I've only ever had bourbon matured, so the the inaugural release, I believe, has some sherry casks in the mix. So that's going to be interesting, uh, seeing how Ardnaho plays with sherry. So yeah, it, it's really exciting. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm sure I'm not alone. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's going to be a big deal, going to be a really big deal. So that's, that's, um, that's kind of what's happening in the whiskey world at the minute. I've got some other things to talk about because I am not long back from Isla uh, as part of the Isla Whiskey Academy Spring Residential Diploma for 2024. I was there for six days in total. We visited nearly all of the distilleries, including the rum distillery. Um, and it's always interesting, you know, you, you see how much the island is changing as you go back for repeat visits, you know. And it, it that's the impression I get at the minute. Isla feels like a place in transition. And I don't know if we know yet quite what it's transitioning into because there's new stuff all the time, you know. I mean, the rum distillery's been there for a few years now. It's, it's working away and it's very small scale, and it's added something a bit new to the island. So, you know, maybe that's there's no harm, no foul. Port Ellen is back up and running. Fairly large scale. But feels maybe like it's putting something back that wasn't that, that shouldn't have been taken away, or you know, I think that's the general feeling. Uh, but then we've got Lagan Bay and the Isla Ales thing, uh, which is working with Ian McLeod Distillers. Again, I don't think the feeling about that's too negative because it, they, they're working on a patch of land that was empty across from the airport. Nothing was happening. It was a, a, a site uh, prime for development. So, you know, maybe there's some positivity there, but I, I don't know. It just It just feels like the island is changing quite a bit. And any time there's change, there's there's concern. Will something be lost? You know, we don't want Isla to turn into whiskey Disneyland. Um, and and while all these new distilleries are are popping up, there's some talk of a few other things maybe stalling, and you know some expansion plans by some of the other distilleries are being put on hold a wee bit. There's concern at the cost of casks going through the roof. Um. So, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting time. Things feel like quite tumultuous. Even on a staffing level, it feels like people are moving on. Barry at Lafroig's decided to move on, the distillery manager. So, yeah, it, you know, it just feels like change is afoot. And and change can be rocky sometimes. So it, it's it's interesting to see where this all ends up, you know. It, it, as I say, the new Ardenho single malt feels like an optimistic moment. It feels like this is the good side of new things coming to Isla. We get the new mall. Everybody gets to see what it's like, hopefully how good it is. But, you know, there's always concerns that things might be going too far. We've got talk of Chivas or Perno, as they're really called, coming to open a, a distillery at Gartbreck. Um, we've got at least one other uh, in talks, I believe. You know, it's just, it's constant, it's constant expansion, constant new distilleries. 
man, there's only so there's only so much room in that island. There's only so much the infrastructure can take. And some people would maybe tell you that that limit was reached quite some time ago. So we'll see. Um, mentioned Port Ellen earlier. Um, I was lucky enough, the Isla Whiskey Academy was lucky enough to get in and see it. Um, we are very grateful for that. I have lots of thoughts about it. Now, this is me talking. This is not the views of the Isla Whiskey Academy, necessarily. This is my opinions, my thoughts. And I have to say they are largely positive, certainly on the production side. Everything that's going on at the distillery itself is pretty cool. You know, I'm, I was really impressed with the distillery and the way it's been set up, uh, the look of it. The the people there, Ali McDonald, who's the distillery manager, was fantastic. He was very down to earth, really knowledgeable and very good at putting his knowledge across. You could tell that he cares about what he's doing and cares about that distillery. And he understands the significance of that distillery coming back to life after 41 years of being closed. You know, he gets it. He knows what it's all about. But he's good at his job, and I think he's he, he appears to very much be the right person to guide the future of that distillery, as well as understanding the significance of its past. You know, um, the the there's a lot of stuff going on sustainability wise. They've they are trying to reuse water and things, and the, there's quite a revolutionary mill in there, unlike anything I've seen at any other distillery. I think the most um, exciting, most interesting, more, most innovative uh, part, though, is in the still house. So technically, there's two still houses, one beside the other. Uh, there's the Phoenix still house, which is the big stills, which are basically an exact replica of what was there before at Port Ellen, running in much the same way as they did before. And on the other side, there's the experimental still house, which has some really interesting quirks about it and seems to open up quite a lot of potential. So they built a new um, spirit safe um, for it, which is completely new. N no other distillery has anything like it. The spirit safe, sorry, the spirit safe can take up to 10 different spirit cuts, I believe. So normally, obviously, you have your three cuts, head, heart, tail. This can now take that into 10 different cuts. And it means, so you take off your heads, which are a bit too spirity or a bit too chemically to be used to mature into whiskey. But then you can break the heart of the run, you can break your spirit run down into like seven or eight different components. So when you think of that, you think of a distillery can shape the character of its whiskey depending on where it takes its spirit cut. The higher you take the cut, the more lighter flavours you're going to get. The lower you take your cut, you might get more of the heavy or peaty, oily uh, phenols coming through. If you can split that into 10, imagine the creativity that that inspires. Imagine the different flavour profiles you could create just from the taking different cuts of the same run. Um, so depending on what you might need, you know, maybe you're looking for the first cut, maybe you're looking for the third, the fourth, the seventh, whatever. The, the possibilities are endless in what you could do there, you know, and I think they're calling it something like they're exploring the the Atlas of Smoke, which is a typically awful Diageo name for something that's actually quite cool, you know, they're going to be able to break down which phenols come through at which part of the run and all this kind of stuff, you know, so it's pretty cool, it's pretty cool. Um, they also, Ali spoke to us about, you know, that the, there's potential there even for huge, huge changes. Like the the stills in the experimental still house are sort of flanged sections, which means you could, in theory, swap out the neck or swap out the line arm and put something totally different on. 
steeper angle, straight, up, up, upward angle, um, a thinner neck, a column neck potentially even. You could do anything really and produce a completely different spirit on the same site. So there's lots of sort of cool, innovative stuff going on there and the people involved seem to know what they're doing and put it across in a, in a great way. My only issue, of course, comes down to, and, and this is no surprise, I spoke about this before, that Diageo were never ever going to let Port Ellen go, right? Port Ellen is their luxury Isla brand, right? And whatever anyone says, I, the only reason they've built that distillery is because sooner or later they're going to run out of stock from the old distillery and then they've lost the brand, they've lost the name, they've lost the exclusive special edition Port Ellens that they can put out every year. So do you let that cash cow just die and fade away? Or do you make a big investment now and then you've got that cash cow forever more? We all know what's happened here, right? The same goes for Brora. They're charging a fortune for old bottlings of Brora. Sooner or later, they run out of stock and then they've lost Brora forever. Or we could redo it, build it again, keep churning out new Brora, still charging excessive prices for it, though. And my fear is that that's what's going to happen. I don't think we're going to see in three, five, ten years' time, we're not going to see a, a £50 bottle of Port Ellen on the market. I just don't believe that. I think they're going to charge £150, £200 for a 10-year-old Port Ellen. That's what I think is going to happen. And my fears are already given some weight by their um, choice of tour system, right? So... There's three tiers to the tours of Port Ellen. I think the top one is £500 a day or something. You'll spend all day there, do the production tour. You get to play around with different spirits in the old kiln and all sorts. Taste various things, pull a sample from a cask from the, the 80s, all that stuff. But £500. The next tier down is £200 which is, a, I don't know what's involved, you know, fairly basic tour, I would imagine, you know, the tour, a taste and whatever, £200 for an afternoon. And then at the bottom, we have a free tour, which sounds great. It's once a month, though. Um, and they're claiming, you know, this is so locals can get in and see it because they're thinking of the local community and all that stuff. But, you know, locals and all the people who are visiting Isla that month or whatever, there's going to be quite a lot of people want in on that one day, I would think, you know. Now, hopefully it works out. Hopefully everybody who wants to see Port Ellen can get in and see Port Ellen without having to pay a fortune to do it. But I just think it's... I think it's tone deaf, right? There's no need for that. There's no need for that at all. You are probably going to make your money back on the, the drams you sell, right? You're going to charge a fortune for this stuff. We know you are. You know you are. Why do you need to charge a fortune just for people to get in and see it? I, I find that really, really poor, really depressing, actually. Because it's, it, what they've done is really cool. Why not show it off to the world? You know, why not flaunt what you've done? It's fantastic. Why not show it to us all? But no, on, only the super rich, you know, on, or only the people willing to throw away £200 on a couple of hours in a distillery tour, only they will get to see it. And that that bugs me, right? Because I I hate exclusivity, right? This, this industry, in lots of ways, is going on and on about inclusivity at the minute, you know, and rightly so. We need to make it more welcoming to people from different cultures and backgrounds. We need to make it more welcoming for women, for example, who are still underrepresented to this day. We need to do more work in these areas. And yet the issue of kind of class or wealth doesn't ever seem to enter the, con the, the conversation, you know. Why is whiskey only a plaything for the wealthy? 
why can't whisky be for everyone? It's only the people who can pay £200, £500 on a day's entertainment can get into Port Ellen. Nah, nah. Let's make whisky for everyone, regardless of budget, background, sex, gender, whatever you want to call it. it whisky should be for all, right? Of legal drinking age, of course, right? It should be for everyone. Let's make it accessible and available to everyone. Let's not have distilleries and brands like Port Ellen or Brora or Macallan. Let's not have them just be wee secret members clubs for the pretentious and the rich and the snobby, basically. And, and unfortunately, that seems to be the road that they're going down with Port Ellen. It just feels like such a shame because it's it's wonderful. I feel privileged that I got in to see it, but I feel sad that other people might not enjoy the same thing because it should be for everyone. It should be for everyone. The visitor centre was nice too. Um, for what it is, you know, it's basically a sitting room and then some nice art things up in the wall and whatnot. Um, beautifully done though um, and the kiln was nice with bottles up on display and all that um, enjoyable an enjoyable experience I, I, I feel lucky to have done it I'm grateful we were given access but yeah it, it just feels like it just feels like we're missing an opportunity here why not make it for everyone right That's, that's distilleries shouldn't be Distilleries should be at the heart of their community, right? And, and saying that you're going to open the distillery up one day a month so that local people can come in and see it. I mean, come on. I, I put a thing up on Instagram, actually, just the other day there because I can't I can't believe somebody at Diageo didn't didn't clock the, the comparison themselves. But I don't know how many of you remember the film Jurassic Park, right? It's hardly an, a, an unknown film. A blockbuster movie from the early 90s, right? And it spawned six sequels or something. There's a scene in the first Jurassic Park movie where John Hammond, Richard Attenborough's character, is um, talking to all the, the people he's, uh, he's sort of assembled and he's telling them everyone should be able to get in and see this part. And the lawyers there, who he describes as the blood-sucking lawyer, and the lawyer's saying, we can charge whatever we want for this. 10,000, 5,000 people will pay it. And John Hammond interrupts him and says, this place should be for everyone. Everyone should be able to get in and enjoy this place. And the blood-sucking lawyer comes back with, sure, yeah, we'll what? We'll have a coupon day or something. That's what Port Ellen have done. That's exactly what Diageo have done with Port Ellen. They've got coupon day where the plebs can come through, the people who can't afford it. You can come in as well. Why not just make it a normal tour that people can pay 15, 20 pounds, whatever, to get in and see the distillery? Come on, man. It's nonsense, total nonsense. And these are the things that are driving more and more people away from whiskey. Anyway, good people involved. Let's hope it becomes a success and let's hope that Diageo change their tack on it a wee bit. Let's hope that they decide to make it more accessible and let's hope they decide to put some Port Ellen out at a price people can actually afford to buy and drink when the time comes. Um, okay, so I think that's probably about where we've, we've, I think we've probably covered enough now. Um, let's leave it at that. In fact, I'll tell you why don't why don't we finish on a wee a wee whiskey uh, recommendation? I because we've been talking so much about Isla, I've got a wee Isla dram here. Uh, this is from Morrison Scotch Distillers. They used to be Morrison and Mackay. It's one of their Isla brands. It's called Mactala. Um, it is a phage release from last year, but there's still quite a lot of it around. It was a fairly sizable release. But I've been really enjoying this. I picked it up in October last year uh, when I was over for the Isla Whiskey Academy. Picked it up at the whiskey shop in Beaumont, which always has a nice wee selection, by the way. Top tip when you're going to Isla, don't forget to try the wee uh, whiskey shop in Beaumont because it's one of the few places, it might be the only place you'll find indie releases 
Um, I mean, it's a, it's like a wee grocery. It's like a grocer's. It's not a, a whiskey shop as such, but it, it's got a whole side of the shop that's just whiskey bottles. Um, and they, they usually have the odd wee bargain. I picked this up for £70, I believe. It's still online. I've seen it £70 to £75. It is Pedro Jimenez Matured. Fejila 2023 bottle, bottled at 54.6%. We don't know the distillery. It's an Isla single malt, though. It's peated. It's in PX Sherry. And it's a wee cracker. For £70, it's a wee cracker. Uh, where are we? There we go. So, yep, yeah, you could do a lot worse. You could do an awful lot worse. All right, folks, that's it for me. I will hopefully see you again soon. And please do feel free to check out ascotonscotch.com, uh, find your way around. And if there's anything else you would like to see on the website, let me know. I'll be glad to put it on there. And if there's anything else you'd like to see me talk about on these videos, again, please let me know. Thanks for watching. Slanjava.